The Medicaid Planning Dilemma. My name is Rocky DeFrancesco and I'm the founder of the Wealth Preservation Institute, the co-founder of the Asset Protection Society and an author of a book called Retiring Without Risk. So what's the problem? There are 40 million Americans today over the age of 65. That's 13% of our total population. There'll, there will be 80 million Americans over the age of 65 by 2040 and 75% of those will, re will require long-term care sometime during their life. 50% of those for over a period of one year, and 20% for over a period of five years. The cost, while wow, the cost of long-term care is crazy. There's a general study out there that says the long-term care costs are increasing obviously from year to year, uh, that the average nursing home costs right now are over $6,500 a month on a nationwide basis. Now, if you're somebody who happens to have Alzheimer's, or if you know somebody who's had it, the cost of care can be in excess a $400,000 uh, just for a five-year stay in a nursing home. So, what your advisors don't know? Well, I got news for you. Most of your advisors don't know anything about Medicaid planning, which is one of the reasons that I've done this presentation and created the Certified Medicaid Planner course. What, what you will see in this presentation really is going to shock you. I mean, most people think somehow the government's going to take care of them. Well, it will, but wait till you see how you have to qualify for this. And look, 95% of the estate planning attorneys, CPAs, financial planners, don't even know the basics about Medicaid planning, let alone uh, all the complicated intricacies of this type of uh, planning. So what that means is that most of our clients or most people out there are totally unprepared for what's going to happen to them when they turn 65 or older. And if you don't plan, guess what could happen to you? It could be total financial ruin. And that's really why it's important to get the word out on this, on this subject matter. So good planning. Well, good planning when it comes you know, mainly in the timing that you do it. So the earlier you can do your planning for Medicaid, uh, the better. So the number one rule is do not wait to plan for your long-term care or doing what's called Medicaid planning. The longer you wait, the, long, the more you run the risk that you're gonna have to spend all of or a significant portion of your money before being able to uh, receive aid. So my rule number two, although this is self-serving, find somebody who knows the subject matter. Again, they're few and far between out there. I prefer that you use somebody that is a certified Medicaid planner because it's somebody who's taken one of my educational courses. But find somebody who knows what they're doing. Not planning for Medicaid planning can be absolutely catastrophic, catastrophic from a financial standpoint. So what are the best ways to pay for long-term care? Well, you know, one of the best ways to pay for it is with long-term care insurance. Unfortunately, the reality is that most people don't want to pay for it. They see it like term life insurance, and nobody likes paying their term life insurance premium. They do it because they feel they need to. But once you play, pay it this year, if you don't die during that year, you can look back in hindsight and say, gosh, that was a waste of money. Most long-term care policies are that way. It's sort of like term insurance. You pay your premium this year. If you need long-term care uh, coverage or, or benefits, it will pay. However, after the year is over, the premium is gone and it's not coming back. Although there are return of premium products out there, but for the most part, it's not coming back. You have to pay that premium again and you pay it again. And you're thinking to yourself, wow, Maybe I'm never going to need long-term care, and except for I keep paying this premium. So clients don't like stroking the check for this long-term care insurance, and many clients can't afford to do it because depending on your age, long-term care insurance can be quite expensive. So let's look at Medicaid at a glance. Medicaid is a very limited home health care benefit. So you don't apply for Medicaid and then stay in your home for months and months and years and years and years and get financial aid. It mainly pays for nursing home costs. Now Medicaid is funded 50% federally, and 50% from the states. Although administratively, it's 100% state run. So the, gov the federal government's gonna kick in some money, the state government's gonna kick in some money. It's gonna be based on a federal law, especially on the 2005 Deficit Reduction Act, which just about every state in the country uh, follows except for California. So it's, it's run by the states, but the states are gonna use a federal statute to administer, uh, administer the program. So what will Medicaid pay for? Well, it, it, uh, it depends, but it pays for several different items depending on whether you're disabled or whether you're elderly. But the main one that we're gonna talk about is nursing home expenses. Medicaid will pay for your full nursing home expense, room, board, all the nursing home costs. The kicker is what? You have to qualify for Medicaid in order to have it pay for it, right? So that's really what I'll be talking about in this presentation. How do you qualify for Medicaid and what's it going to cost you before you qualify for Medicaid? And by the way, keep in mind that not every nursing home does, uh, accepts Medicaid. Some do, some don't. So there's several different rules that we have to follow. I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna cover the main ones in this presentation. So we have these asset qualification rules in order to apply and be accepted for Medicaid. What does that mean? It means that if you have too many countable assets, 
you're disqualified and you can't apply for aid. Well, you could apply, but you're not going to get it. So, how many countable assets are you allowed to have if you're a single person? So you're seven years old, you're a widow, or you've always been single, or whatever it is. How much can you have in assets in order to apply and be accepted for Medicaid? $2,000. $2,000. That will come as a shock to many of you. Well, but I've got $50,000 in a CD. I'm sorry, you don't qualify for Medicaid. What if you're a married couple? Well, for married couples, it's quite a bit different, and I've got a slide that hopefully you can see up there. I don't want to read it verbatim, but it has, it has the, uh, the language on there. There are what are called 50% uh, states and non-50% states. With a married couple, the community spouse or the well spouse or the, the spouse that isn't going into the nursing home, they can have countable assets up to a little over $109,000, okay? So collectively, if, if the couple, and specifically that well spouse, the community spouse has $109,000, they get to keep those assets so long as the, the spouse going into the nursing home has $2,000 or less in that person's name. So that's good, right? Uh, but in a 50% state, let's look at an example. So now let's assume we have a couple that has $202,000 in assets. How do we qualify this couple, or at least one of the, the, the spouses that's going to a nursing home, how do we qualify them for aid in this 50% state? They've got way over $109,000 in assets. You know what they have to do? They have to spend down all but uh, uh, that $109,000, right? Which means what? You're going to have to spend basically $100,000 on something, mainly probably their own aid, their own care, if you will, before they qualify for Medicaid. So, wow, I got $200,000. I'll have to go get nursing home uh, care coverage for my spouse. I'm sorry. Please go spend $100,000 on her own care first and then come back to us and apply for aid. That's basically what they're telling you. Now, in a non-50% state, the community spouse can retain any amount up to $109,000. So they don't split it. They don't force you to do, sort of, uh, to do what they do in the 50% states. But the bottom line is, how much assets do you have as you're watching this? As a couple, do you own more than $109,000 or more than $110,000? Or do you have $200,000 or do you have $300,000? You are going to have to reallocate that money other places, and I'll talk about that, to qualify, or you're going to have to spend it on your own aid. So how, how do most people think of this? Well, it's, hey, it's not a problem. I know I've got all this extra money. I know how to qualify for aid. I'll just give my money away. Now, I don't have to, in my example, I had 200000 or 202. i I'll just give away $100,000. Now I'm going to qualify, right? Wrong. There's a 60-month look back. So when you go apply for Medicaid, what they're going to do is they're going to look at all the gifts you made for the last 60 months. And anything that you've given away for the last 60 months is going to be used to penalize you. So uh, if you had, if you gave away $100,000, let's go ahead and just go through an example here on the next slide. If we have Mr. Smith or Mrs. Smith, who's got 75, age 75, has countable assets of $100,000, okay? She now needs her nursing home care and wants to apply for Medicaid. She's single. In my example, she's single. She basically has to give away all of her money down to $2,000. So let's say she gifted away $98,000. She's happy, right? Hey, it's not a problem. I gave my money to my heirs. I've only got $2,000 when I go apply for Medicaid. No problem, right? Wrong. Medicaid's going to look back 60 months. Now, if the average cost of nursing home care in her state is $5,000, you're going to take $98,000, you're going to divide it by five, and you know what her penalty period is going to be? Approximately 20 months. What does that mean? It means that when she applied, Medicaid's going to tell her, why don't you come back in 20 months and reapply? Because we're going to apply for you a 20-month penalty. No, no, but I gave my money away. I don't have it anymore. I give it to my kids. I'm sorry. It doesn't matter. You don't have 2,000, we really think you have 100,000 by our look back period. Come back in 20 months and see us. What's the senior gonna say then? What's Mrs. Smith gonna do? Oh, I didn't know that. Well, you know, uh, first of all, I know that's the case, which is why I educate on the subject matter, but uh, which is why it's vitally important that you work with somebody who does know this so they can give you advice. So, now, how can Mrs. Smith qualify immediately for aid? Because it sounds like a little bit of a doom and gloom right now that I'm saying. Well, you can convert your countable assets to non-countable assets. So first of all, what are countable assets? I'm not going to give you an exhaustive list, but cash, CDs, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, IRA money, cash value life insurance, tax deferred annuity, these are all countable. Well, I've got $200,000 in my IRA. Guess what? You're not qualifying for aid tomorrow. So we're going to convert them. It simply means taking these countable assets and converting them into non-countable. Now, what are non-countable assets? The primary non-countable asset is your residence. So you can have a personal residence, uh, up to $500,000 value. So I've got a $500,000 house, it's paid off. Guess what? It's a non-countable asset, so that's good. 
a, a car of any price, you know, it sounds funny because people like to play games with this, a car of any price. You mean I can go buy a brand new car worth $50,000 and not have that be a gift or uh, uh, something that prohibits me from getting aid? Yup. So long as you can justify the cost of the new car, you can go buy a $50,000 new car. Now, I would submit to you that if you're 85 years old or 80 years old, it's probably not going to be a Ferrari because they're not going to approve that. Now, if it's a van that's handicap accessible or whatever and it costs $50,000 because of some of the accessories, that's okay. It is, a, it is an exempt expenditure, so you can convert some cash into a car, one car. One of my favorites is a prepaid uh, funeral and burial expense. I mean, hey, look, we're all going to die, right? And at death, we all are going to have some sort of burial expenses. Now, whether you want a full-blown uh, burial uh, you know, in a cemetery with a, with a casket, etc., or whether you want to be cremated, the, the cost will be somewhat different, but we're all going to die. Somebody's going to have to deal with that at your death. Who's it going to be? Typically, it's going to be your heirs, right? Your child, your grandchild, who's ever around, they're the ones that are going to have to deal with this. And somebody's going to have to pay for it. Now, I hope that I pay for my own death. Uh, I know that my parents are going to pay for their own death, although I'd, you know, they've done a lot for me. I'd be happy to help them. But most seniors are like, I don't want to burden my family with my death. Um, I almost want it to be a festive occasion. Celebrate my life and don't get grumpy that I didn't leave you any money to pay for my burial. So an exempt expenditure is the ability to pay, prepay your burial. And it depends on the state you're in. Typically between twelve dollars and $15,000 is the number. So you can convert some of your cash or CDs or whatever. You can prepay your burial. It's an exempt expenditure. It will not help you incur a penalty. We can use promissory notes, which I'm not going to get into in this presentation. Uh, but you can also use a Medicaid compliant annuity. So you could literally take $100,000 cash or in CDs, which is countable, pay a premium into what's called a Medicaid compliant annuity, which I'm not going to cover in, in great detail in this presentation. And you can immediately qualify for aid because you've moved it from a countable asset to a non combo Now, I will tell you that with the Medicaid annuity, the way it's structured, it's going to immediately start paying you income. And guess where that income is going to go? It's going to go to the nursing home, but that's not the end of the world. At least you qualified for aid immediately. Again, this is not an exhaustive list um, because you could also pay off debt on your home and there's, you could use personal service contracts. There's a lot of other ways you can take countable assets and convert them. But my point is, you know, while I've been a little bit doom and gloom so far in this presentation, you know, there are things you can do to, to qualify for AIDS. So let's, uh, let's see here. Let me go through that Mrs. Smith example again. Remember she had $98,000 in countable assets. I'm going to show you how to immediately qualify Mrs. Smith for aid. First thing she's going to do, she's going to spend $15,000 to prepay her burial. No problem. Take care of her family. She's going to buy a new car, $23,000 new car. No problem. Exempt expenditure. And she's going to put $60,000 into a Medicaid compliant annuity. It's going to crank out an income to her at $380 a month. That, that, now by the way, again, that money is going to go directly to the nursing home to pay for her care, but she can immediately apply for aid as soon as she makes these expenditure. 